Good evening. How are you, my brother? Good evening, Cousin Joyce. God bless you and Wester for joining tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Good evening, Pastor Richards. Thank you for joining tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to go ahead and get started. Open up in prayer at this moment. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. I'm going to start off today reading a devotional from the book, More of You, God. God bless you, Victor. Thank you for joining. And it says, God, I want to see things that you have yet to occur. Today, Lord Jesus, I'm asking for the spirit of faith. Father, I trust in your word and in your promises. You are a God who does not lie. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. I believe if you said it, it shall be done. Right now, I may not see it in the natural, but I see it in the supernatural. I am rejoicing in your promises. Throughout my life's experience, Father, my faith grows as I walk with you. Also, it grows through hearing and studying your word. Every day I walk with you, I see and feel your faithfulness manifest in my life. I yearn, for, I yearn for you as my faith grows. Lord, you are my rock. I will not let worldly things disturb me. You have, you have my life in the palm of your hands. I know that I know you are going to take care of all things in my life, and you're going to work them out to my good. My faith keeps growing with having and hearing of more of you, God. Amen. Amen. I just love the devotional from this book. Very inspirational and encouraging every day as we trust God in his word. It, God is so faithful. He's sovereign and holy. And he always reminds us of his loving kindness that when we walk by faith, we can experience God's love towards us that we can demonstrate to someone else the way God loves us. Amen. Amen. Such an awesome experience to know that God is on your side. No matter what you encounter in this life, you can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, loving not your life even unto death. Tonight, we're going to discuss from the book again, uh, more uh, uh, the battlefield of the mind. Battlefield of the mind. We're going to uh, be continuing in the chapter 14, a passive mind. So let's open up in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, I thank you tonight for your goodness and mercy bestowed upon us. I thank you, Lord God, for the Holy Spirit who's working in our lives every day to will and do according to your good pleasure. We ask, Father God, that you remove the business from the day from our minds, that we can focus on you to hear the word from the Lord and receive a rhema word that would change our thinking, would change our lifestyles, that we be conducive to the life of Jesus Christ as we walk by faith and not by sight. 
Cleanse our minds and our hearts, O oh God, from sin and iniquity. Forgive us for our sins, knowingly, unknowingly, and wash us in the blood of the Lamb, and purify our thoughts tonight, O oh God, that we have a clear conscience and a clear heart to receive the Word of God that's able to save our souls. And we thank you, O oh God, for every person that desired to be on tonight has come, God, even those who have not made it yet online, that you would speak to their hearts, O oh God, by divine revelation, a rhema word that would, Father, invoke them to get into your presence and provoke us, God, to bow down and worship you in the beauty of holiness, exalting your magnet name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Lashonda, my fiance, thank you for tuning in as usual each week. My faithful participant, her and Wester, I thank God for you both and Victor. You all always participate in this. I thank God for you being diligent and, and desiring to want to hear the teaching from the Lord. And I pray that this word is help changing your thought life, is, is empowering you to get into the word of God for yourself, that you can know God's heart, know what he has for you and the promises he has for your life that he has to manifest in you when you walk in obedience to the truth and the righteousness of his word by the Holy Spirit. So tonight, we're going to thank God for my son just came on tonight. Thank you, son. God bless you. Good to see you on tonight. So last week, the last couple of weeks, actually, we talked about a passive mind. And we, we talked about how, how dangerous it is to be in a place of passivity because without the spirit of a living God working in your life, you'll find yourself in a dangerous place where the enemy can lure you away from the truth and from the righteousness of God into a place of passivity, a place of dormancy, a place of being inactive, a place that will bring you to a place of destruction. And the plan of the enemy is to take away your zeal, to take away your drive, to take away your power that's been given to you by the Holy Spirit to get you in a place of dormancy. In a place, when you're in a place of dormancy, you're just sitting there. You're doing nothing. You're letting life pass you by. And that's what the enemy wants you to be inactive where you're not doing anything to promote the kingdom of God in your life or the lives of anyone else that's in your life. And it's so important to recognize your enemy, to know his strategies, to know his pattern, to know his influences and allow the Holy Spirit to lead and direct you in the way of truth, in the way of righteousness, to change your life forever. And I guarantee when you get the word of God inside of you, the Lord will even deal with habits and addictions that we face with on a daily basis, the struggles that we have in our flesh from coming to God and making excuses, the reason why I can't live right. The Holy Spirit will deal with those different areas in your life when you learn how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you from the power of the living God. So tonight we're going to engage and... Um, in the other other uh, section of the book, we talked about an empty space in the is a is a place. An empty space is a place. We talked about that, where the place we give Satan is often empty, an empty space in our minds. And one thing about the enemy, when there's an empty space in your mind, and what I mean by that is where you're not studying the Word of God, you're not meditating on the Word of God, you're not getting the Word of God inside of your spirit. So the enemy finds that place empty. And when Jesus was talking to his disciples on one occasion, he told them about a strong man. When he's, when he's at peace, his goods at peace. But he said, when a strong man he comes, he says, then you can overthrow that enemy and spoil his goods. Not only that, another case, he talked about a person who swept out their house, but they didn't put anything back in his place. So when the devil left, he went searching for another, another dwelling place, and he found that there wasn't any, any place to go. He, he went and got seven more demons, more spirits, and they came back to claim ownership of their house. And that's the house that we give and we allow ourselves to be in a place of emptiness. And God wants your mind to be filled with the word of God, filled with the fruit of the spirit that you can always come back and overcome the stronghold of the enemy in your mind. And, and when he wanders in dry places for a season, he comes back. And that's what the enemy does. He leaves for a season, but he will soon come back again to attack you in a place where you're vulnerable. So we got to recognize the spirit of passivity. And then we have to overcome passivity. 
So overcoming passivity is recognized. I have an issue. I have a problem. And I need the Lord to help me. And the way God helps us when we study the word of God and we pray, and then God will begin to minister to your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit to change your thought life, to bring you to a place of revelation and an understanding of the heart of God where he can influence to give you a desire and a will and a purpose to walk in his way. So you got to get into the word, word of God. God knows we all have some areas in our lives where we're weak and some areas where we struggle the most. But there's no excuse for not giving it over to the Lord. When you give your issues to the Lord, the Lord promises he will deal with that better than what you can. And the enemy wants you to get to the place where you make excuses. The reason why I can't change, so he wants you to make excuses and get you to a place where you walk in darkness and blind it from the truth. Amen. So, the next point is we have to make decisions. God doesn't force you to change your mind. God doesn't force you to change your will and desires. He gives you the choice. to You can choose this day who you will serve. Either you serve the God of the enemy or you serve the Lord God himself. But Joshua said in this way, he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And that's what you have to make a decision to do is serve the Lord no matter what comes your way. So tonight we're going to talk about right actions follows right thinking. Right actions follows right thinking. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is one of my favorite scriptures that's in the book of the Bible. And God always talks about the importance of getting in the word of God and allowing the word to get inside of you by changing your thought life. So in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, chapter 12, my thing acted up here. Okay, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. In the easy to read Bible, I'm going to read it verse 1. It says, in the English Standard Version of the Bible, so I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, by that testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. You have to get to the place in yourself where you have to do the work. Faith without works is dead. So first of all, Paul is talking to the church in Rome, said, I, I appeal to you, I plead to you, that you make a decision by the mercy of God to present yourself as living sacrifice. And the way we present ourselves as a living sacrifice is get into the word of God and recognize that, hey, I need to die to myself, die to my own agenda, die to my own mindset, my own plan, my own desires, my will, my emotions, the things that drive me the most. I need to die to that where I can live in Christ Jesus to the fullness of who he is. And then Christ will accept you as a spiritual worship. Because when you offer yourself everything that you are to his, to his authority, he takes you as a sacrifice and presents you before the Father, and God will begin in turn meet your every need by the Spirit. But then he says, do not be formed, be shaped, be patterned after the mindset of the world. And that's an issue that many people in the body of Christ have and because we're easily influenced by the things of the world and not the spirit of a living God. you got to allow the spirit of God to change your thought life. And what I mean by that is when you get into the word of God, God's word begins to drive out the, the mindset of the worldly mentality where you are ple you want to do everything to please your, your flesh. All that's in the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the, of the flesh, and the pride of life. God wants to purge those desires and bring them under subjection to the Lordship of Jesus Christ where your life is began to form 
and be be shaped and patterned in the image and the likeness of who he is in your mindset. And when your mind begins to change, then you begin to live a fruitful and abundant life in Christ Jesus. So you got to get to the place where you're willing to say, okay, God, I tried it my way for so long, now I'm ready to give it up. And that's what God is looking for, a people who would give up their desires, give up their mindset, give up their, their attitude, give up the way you're living, and allow the Spirit of God to begin to change everything that you're doing to manifest himself in your life. So you got to get to the place where you begin to recognize, hey, I can't do this without Christ. I got to rec- I got to give myself to the Lord and allow the Spirit of God to begin to shape my, my mindset back into the image and likeness of who he is. And when we do that, the Word of God begins to filtrate the mentality of the world out of you and begin to change you to the place where you begin to live into the fullness and the fruitfulness of who he is. So, it says, and uh, there is a dynamic principle shown throughout God's word. And no person will ever walk in victory unless he understands and operates in it. There is a dynamic, a a, a system, a order that God has placed in, in position that we are to live by through the word of God. In order to live in victory, you got to line yourself up with the word of God and walk along the precepts and the divine order that God has destined for your life. And when you do that, then God can begin to change your thought life, begin to change your actions, change your attitude. And everything about you would be, begin to begin the mindset, I want to please the Lord. And, and I tell you, when you do that, God knows exactly what you, what you need in the right time when you need it. Right actions follows right thinking. Right actions, that's a very profound statement. It, right action follows right thinking. And I tell you, when you do this, God will begin to change your direction and the destiny he has set in order for your life. Let me put it another way. You will not change your behavior until you change your thought life. You will not change your behavior until you change your thought life. And I tell you, and that's very important for us as believers. When you recognize, I have a problem, God knows how to change everything that you're doing to bring him glory. In order, in God's order of things, right thinking comes first and right action follows. And that's something you need to write down. In God's order of things, the way he's shaping your life, the plan he has for your life, the vision he has for your life, in order for things to change your life, right thinking comes first. So until you change your mindset, your actions are never going to change. You can try to live your life the way God wants to live without changing your mind, and you will always fail. Because if your mind doesn't change, I'm always reminded of of Norman Vincent of when he wrote in one of his writings, he he said, what a man thinks he is, is what he is. So a man, not what he thinks, but what he is, is what he is. And that's what happens when we don't change our mind, we begin to become what our actions are. So when everybody see you, they never see a change in you. They only see what you're doing. They only see your life, your behavior, the pattern that you're living. And God is trying to change that about you to where your life begins to die to the flesh, but live in the spiritual life. The spiritual life should be able to dominate your flesh on a daily basis. But if, the, if your mind is not changing by feeding your mind with the word of God, the spirit that have no power or influence over your flesh. So you got to recognize, I have to change my thought life in order to change my action. I believe that the right action or correct behavior is a fruit of right thinking. Right action or correct behavior is a fruit of right thinking. Most believers struggle trying to do right, but fruit is not the product of struggle. You hear what I just said? Most people have a problem trying to do right, but the fruit 
which is the come from the Holy Spirit, is not a product of your struggles. Why? Because we eliminate the fruit of the Spirit because we focus on our struggles instead of focusing on God. Fruit comes as a result of abiding in the vine. The fruit of the Spirit cannot operate in your life until you are connected to Jesus Christ, who is the vine and the Father, the vine dresser. St. John chapter 15, verse 4. Abiding in the vine involves being obedient. Abiding in the vine involves being obedient. You must discipline your body. You must buffet your body to get it into a position where your body will willingly yield to obedience of following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I always use Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to, 20, 22 to 24. When teaching this principle, strip yourselves of your former nature, put off and discard your old unrenewed self, which is characterized by a previous manner of life, and become corrupt, through the lust and desires that spring from delusions. And that's what happens when we're not walking in the spirit, we're walking in the flesh, which is corrupt through the lust and desires of the flesh. And when God is trying to change that pattern in your life, it becomes resistance. And that's what we find ourselves doing a lot of times is resisting the spirit's leadership when he's trying to change our, our lifestyle, our behavior, we, we put up so much of resistance and rebel against the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and we find ourselves being frustrated, aggravated, and trapped and snared by the enemy's plans. So anything that he brings against you for your demise, it becomes easy for him to do because you're not guarding your heart. You're not putting anything in your mindset to keep you on the right track. It takes discipline on a daily basis to keep yourself in divine order of following God's way of living in the truth of God's word. Amen? So then it says, verse 24 continues the thoughts by saying, and put on the new nature, the regenerated self created in God's image, God-like in true righteousness and holiness. So it's a work that you have to do. God did what he's going to do when he sent Jesus. Jesus completed the work of redemption. He, cre he, he completed the work of the regeneration of the mindset. But it's up to you to maintain your freedom. And the problem comes in when we know what God tells us to do, but because the desires of the flesh become so strong and overpowering of the Spirit of God in us, we grieve the Holy Spirit. We sadden the Holy Spirit because when he's trying to influence you to do what God wants you to do, turn off the television, turn off the radios, turn off the telephones, get into a place of consecration, begin to fast and pray and seek God's face. The flesh says, well, my favorite program's on right now. I, I, I'll consecrate later. I'll do all that stuff later because I, I, want, I really want to see my program. So we allow our desires or I need to fix dinner, or I got to go to the store, or I got to do this. We have all, all a whole list of agenda of things that we want to do to satisfy ourselves. When the Holy Spirit says, take this time out, when you get up in the morning, seek my face, pray, tell God thank you. Get into a place of, of submission to the Holy Spirit's leadership, then your day will be patterned after the leadership of the Holy Spirit Throughout the day, the whole day will be ordered by God until you get to the place where you're willing to say, okay, God, I've done it my way long enough. Now I want to follow your way. God's way is an easy way. It's a smooth way. But he said the way of a transgressor, when you hear the spirit leading and driving and pulling and tugging at your heart to do the things that God wants you to do, he says, you begin to transgress. You go against what God has put in order for the Spirit to do in your life, so you find yourself in a place of bondage and a spiritual imprisonment in your mindset. That's why so many believers find themselves easily confused in their minds when they get up in the morning. They find themselves sick because of transgressions. They find themselves in a place of wilderness because of transgressions. And God is trying to get us to know that, hey, 
You don't have to go in that way anymore because I made a way smooth for you to walk in, which is called truth and righteousness. And when you walk the way I ordained for you to walk, the blessings of God will begin to release in your life. We hold up our own blessings because of our rebellion and our stubbornness and our pridefulness, our haughtiness. God says when we let go of ourselves, the Holy Spirit inside of you will begin to manifest himself in you to bring to fullness of truth and righteousness. But it's up to you to recognize, hey, I can't do anything without God in my life. That's what God wants us to do every day is submit, yield, and release ourselves to his authority, to his will, to his plan, to his desire to please him. Then it goes on and says, so we see that verse 22 basically tells us to stop acting improperly. Stop misbehaving. Stop opposing God. Stop resisting God. Put on the full armor of God that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Walk improperly. Stop acting improperly. You know, walk properly in the divine order of God. And then verse 22 tells us, begin acting properly. So you have a desire to do what you want to do when the Spirit leaves you, when you listen to the Spirit. But you have a desire of the flesh to do what you want to do when you don't listen to the Spirit of God. Verse 23, what I call the bridge scripture, it tells us how to get from verse 22 acting improperly to verse 24 acting properly. And it says, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. This is the bridge that holds us together as a unit in Christ Jesus, as a body of Christ. It's when we come together in one accord, being constantly, it didn't say sometimes, when you feel like it and when you don't. It didn't say on conditions or your terms and requirements. It says be constantly. That's a, a daily process. By getting in the word, yielding to the Holy Spirit, when you allow the Holy Spirit inside of you to teach you, to guide you, to instruct you, to counsel you, to direct you in the way God wants you to go, in the spirit of your mind, <coughs> you will have a fresh mental and a spiritual attitude. In other words, you have the attitude of Christ to love your enemies and pray for those who despitefully misuse you, say all men are evil against you falsely for his name's sake, for so persecuted prophets who went before you, you can bless them and curse not. Why? Because the Holy Spirit inside of you will lead you in divine order on how to deal with your enemy. And one thing I had to learn throughout the years of ministry, 36 years of ministry, is when the enemy comes to attack me through people, I'm not fighting against flesh and blood. I'm fighting against a spirit inside the individual that's not of God, a demonic spirit that's influencing them to attack me. And when you recognize that it's a spirit of the enemy attacking you, that's why I always say a lot of times, recognize the spirit behind the spirit. Because if you got an affliction and you're always sick and you keep confessing I'm sick, there's a spirit that keeps influencing you to keep saying you're sick so you get sick, so you get the spirit of sickness. And the enemy is behind that spirit to keep it activated in your life. But when you change your thinking and have a fresh mentality, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, stop saying you're sick. Stop saying you're broke. Stop saying you don't have anything. Stop saying you're poor. Stop saying what the enemy wants you to say and start saying what God wants you to say. And when you change your conversation, your conversation will begin to manifest what the Spirit of God wants you to say by the power of the Holy Spirit who's working in your life. It is so important to get in line with the Word of God on a daily basis, allow the Word of God to purge you from the mind of the enemy to produce the mind of Christ inside of your mind. It is impossible to get from wrong behavior to right behavior without first changing thoughts. It is impossible, no way, no how, to get from wrong behavior, bad habits, addictions, 
strongholds, bondages, to right behavior without first changing your thought life. It takes 21 days to form a habit, be it good or bad. God can break that thing less than 21 days. He can break it in a day if you choose to let him. It's up to you to make up in your mind, hey, I'm dealing with this addiction. I'm dealing with this problem. I'm dealing with anger issues. I'm dealing with malice and jealousy issues. I'm dealing with pornography. I'm dealing with sexual sins, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You have to recognize, identify the enemy who's operating in your life, in your mindset. And when you recognize, allow the Holy Spirit to change your thought life, your thought life, then your whole entire life will change. A passive person may want to do the right thing, but he would never do it unless he perfectly activates his mind and line this up with God's word and will. A passive person, we talked about, a person who's inactive, who's not doing anything, and they feel, well, I'm not doing anything to hurt nobody. I'm not doing anything at all. That's the most dangerous thing you can be doing is nothing. Because now you're sitting idle, and the idle mind is a devil workshop. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians, I think it's 4.23, don't give no foothold to the devil. Because the devil will come into your mind in that empty space and begin to influence and fill you up with all of his, his stuff to destroy your entire life. So people lose their mind, commit suicide because they lost their mind. You didn't put Christ in your mind. You didn't put the fruit of the Spirit in your mind. You didn't put the Word of God in your mind. So when the enemy decides to fill your mind up with all his junk, his garbage, you accept it as gospel. And you hold on to that mess, and that mess eventually dries you up and steals your life. And that's what God is trying to break off of the people of God tonight to let us know that, hey, you don't have to stay in that state of mind. You can change your thought life by the power of the Holy Spirit. An example that comes to mind involves a man who once asked for prayer at one of my seminars. He had a problem with lust. He really loved his wife and did not want their marriage to be destroyed, but, he, but his problem needed to be solved or he would surely ruin his marriage. How many people you know who have the spirit of lust in them? And God is saying, you need to recognize what that problem is you have in your life. Don't make an excuse. Don't cover it up. Don't try to hide it for a season or bury it in your treasure chest of your heart. But allow the Holy Spirit to expose that thing. So this man, he recognized he had a spirit of lust. And he came to the seminar and asked for prayer because he didn't want to destroy his marriage. So then he goes and said, Joyce, I have a problem with lust, he said. I just cannot seem to stay away from other women. When you pray, will you pray for my deliverance? I have been prayed for many times, but never seemed to make any progress. This is what the Holy Spirit prompted me to tell him. Yes, I will pray for you, but you must be accountable for what you not allow to show on the picture screen of your mind. You hear what I said? You are responsible. You must be accountable for what you allow to show on the picture screen of your mind. You cannot visualize pornography and picture it in your, in your thinking. Or imagine yourself with these other women if you want to ever enjoy freedom. So in other words, you got to recognize that I'm dealing with this issue. This has been a stronghold in my life for so many years. And I tried to change my life. And it's like every time I try to change my mind, I do good for a little while or for a season. But then around the same time of year, this same attack comes against me. How many times that happened to you? When you do good, let's say you're an alcoholic and you pray for God to deliver you from drinking and God deliver you. And then certain incidents happen around certain times of the year that triggers the drinking spirit again in you. And you start picking up the bottle again and start back drinking. Or you have a lustful spirit and God delivers you from that lustful spirit. And then a certain time of the year, you get vulnerable because you, you stop praying, you stop fasting, you stop seeking God's face. So that same spirit has the influence and the power to come back into your life and take over you again. 
and you find yourself walking in the same old pattern of the old nature that's not of God. God said we got to be accountable. Stop making excuses for the reason we do wrong. You know we're going to do wrong, but God says admit it. That's one thing God hates is a liar. He says a liar shall not tarry in my sight, but shall find himself in the lake of fire. A liar is one of the worst things that God detests in the Bible besides blasphemy. When you become a liar, you're telling God that you're no good, the blood of Jesus wasn't good enough to cleanse me, wasn't good enough to save me, or good enough to keep me. And God is saying, recognize, be accountable for the things you allow to go into your mind, to your ear case, to your mindset, and to your heart to ruin your life. And when you recognize I have an issue with these certain things in my life, God says, that's the best place to be, is accountable. And when you acknowledge that God, I tried this over and over and over. And every time I try to do right, evil was always present. Read Romans chapter 7. Paul had the same issue. He talked about how he tried to do good, but he always ended up doing wrong. When he tried, tried not to do wrong, he found himself, you know, not even doing good. Because why? It's a law that's working in, in our members called sin. And this law of death. And that thing is what the enemy wants to use in your life to destroy you on a daily, daily, daily basis. It's a process that he does in our lives to gradually creep into your heart and destroy your destiny. God has a purpose. God has a plan for every person that's a part of the body of Christ. And in his plan and his purpose is blessings, is prosperity, is peace, is longevity of life. It's healing, it's deliverance, it's victory. But if we don't recognize that, hey, I'm a child of God, I don't have to continue to walk in the same lifestyle, pornography, homosexuality, lesbianism, transgender, doesn't matter what it is. God says you have the power to change your thinking by surrendering to him. And when we yield ourselves to the Lord, guess what? He takes away the excuses. He take away the stronghold. He take away the chains of bondage. He take the burdens off your shoulders and the, and the yokes off your neck. He set you free on the inside of your mindset and your actions begin to follow suit to do with just what God wants you to do to be a witness for him. So then it goes on and says, like this man, others have come to realize on the spot why they're not experiencing a breakthrough, even though they want to be free. They want to change their behavior, but not their thinking. You hear what I just said? Many people have issues, and they want to change their lives and get a breakthrough, but the problem comes in, you want to change your behavior, but you don't want to change your thought life. Behavior and thought life works together. Behavior and thought life works together. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to come into us, he changed your thought life, then your behavior begins to change and be con conducive and patterned in the mindset of Christ to now the life I live, I live a free, a fruitful, abundant life, a pleasant life, glorifying God in my body. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, a lot of part of that chapter, said, know you not that you're a temple of the Holy Ghost, that God's going to dwell in an unclean temple. So we have to recognize that our bodies is not our own. We've been purchased with the price. Therefore, we belong to God. And when you know that you belong to God, it's up to you to recognize that, hey, if my life belongs to God, then why am I keep allowing myself to fall in the same trap? Why am I allowing myself to get stuck in quicksand. The enemy has a spiritual place of quicksand that will get you in trap when you begin to sink. If you ever seen in the movies when people walk into quicksand, the more they struggle, the deeper they sunk. That's the spiritual message. The more we struggle with the habits and addictions, the problems, the ill behavior, opposing and, and resisting God, the harder it becomes and the deeper we sink in sin. But God has a remedy called Jesus. And Jesus has the ability. 
He has the power to pull you out of your pitfall of despair, take you out of the quicksand and clean you up and purify your thought life and your actions and, to, and change your heart to take out the heart of, of the world and create a heart of the spirit. The mind is often the area where people play around with sin. The mind is often an area where people play around with sin. Think about it. You're living in sin. You're dwelling in sin. You're walking in sin. Every day you're producing sin out of your life. He says, guess what? That's where you play with sin. Because your mind tells you to do what the flesh wants to do. And you do it anyway. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who so much as looks and a woman with an evil desire for her has already committed adultery where? With her heart. With, with her in his heart. So he said, you already done it. If you thought it, you done it. That's deep. So if I think myself, I see a, a beautiful woman walking down the street, and I look at her, and I keep looking at her until that lustful desire wells up inside of me to what, in my mind, I'm sleeping with her. Jesus said, because you thought it in your mind, you already done done it. Because that's what the mind does. The mind produces sinful behavior because we give it the power to do so in our lives. The way for sinful action is paved through sinful thinking. The way for sinful action is paved through sinful thinking. And that's what the enemy does. He works in our mindsets. He paves the way. He makes it clear before you where well, you cannot avoid it. So you got to see what he wants you to see. And you got to hear what he wants you to hear until your body begins to manifest what he wants you to do. A woman who attended my first home Bible study had committed her life to the Lord and wanted her home and marriage to be straightened out. Everything in her life was a mess. Her home, her children, her marriages, her finances, her physical condition, etc., she openly said that she did not leave, she did not love her husband. In fact, she actually despised him. Knowing that her attitude was not, not godly, she was willing to love him, but she could not seem to tolerate being around him. That's a sad place to be. We prayed, she prayed, and everyone prayed. We shared the scriptures with her and gave her recorded teachings to listen to. We did everything we knew to do. And even though she was seemingly to follow our advice, she made no progress. What was wrong? During the counseling session, it was revealed that she had been a daydreamer all her life. She was always imagining a fairy tale existence in which she was the princess and the prince charming came home from work with flowers and candy, sweeping her off her feet with his devotion to, to her. So here's what happened. And we do it all the time. We be in a relationship. And you say you love the individual that you're with. But until you see somebody that, that seems to be looking better, be more educated, more wealthy. So in your mind, you're imagining this is what I want my, my relationship to be. And because she's not curved the way you want her to be curved, she don't have the desire that like the other person have that draws your attention. False images that enemy puts in your mind. So you begin to daydream your life with that other person. So the problem comes in when we daydream what the enemy wants to get put in our minds as images that's contrary to what we have in our lives. We begin to deceive ourselves. The Bible says that God tempts no man with evil. But men are tempted when they're drawn away with their evil desires. Your desires, your daydreaming of the way you feel your life needs to be with somebody else because the one you have don't seem to be good enough for you anymore. God says you're living an illusion. You're deceiving yourself. So she spent her days thinking like this when, she, when, when, her, when her, her tired, overweight, sweaty, and dirty husband came home from work from working hard all day with one tooth missing, she despised him. Think about this situation for a moment. The woman was born again 
and yet her life was a mess. She wanted to obey God and live for him, and she also wanted to love her husband because she knew it was God's will. She was willing to have the victory in her life and marriage, but her mind was defeating her. You hear what I just said? She wanted to obey God. She wanted to follow him. She wanted to love her husband. Everything God wanted her to do, she was willing to do it. But her mind prevented her from living a victorious life in her relationship. There was no way she could overcome her disgust for her husband until she began to operate out of a sound mind. That sound mind is a sober mind, a spiritual mind, a godly mind. Until you get to the place where your mind is back on the Holy Spirit, walking in the Word of God, living the body in the Word of God, your mind will continue to live a defeated life. And your life will be defeated because of the way you think. She was mentally living in the world that did not exist and never would. Therefore, she was totally unprepared to deal with reality. She had a passive mind, and since she was not choosing her own thinking according to the word of God, the evil spirit injected thoughts into her mind. That is a very powerful and a dangerous statement that we find ourselves falling into on a daily basis without the mind of Christ. The enemy injects you, just like when people inject themselves with heroin to get a high. The devil does the same thing with believers. Born again believers, God's people, God's children, God's chosen one, God's prized possession. He says the enemy will inject your thought life with the thoughts he wants to put inside of you to cause you to live a delusional lifestyle and cause you to get to the place of, of defeat and failure and doubting God's word. As long as she thought that they were on their, excuse me, <clears throat> as long as she thought they were on her thoughts and enjoyed them, she would never experience victory. So as long as she had the mind of the enemy, she would never experience victory. She changed her thinking and her life began to change. She changed her mental attitude towards her husband and began to change. And he began to change his appearance and his behavior towards her. So you see how God operates? When we're willing to say, oh God, this is who I am. This is what I'm dealing with. And this is the way I'm thinking. God has the power to strip the enemy of his armor in your mind and begin to cover you in the armor of the Holy Spirit to ward off the injection of the thoughts of the enemy where it cannot penetrate your mindset anymore. The enemy only has the power that you give him over your mind. You give him power, he takes authority over your mind, he injects your mind, and he deceives your mind, and he leads your whole life down a pathway of destruction. Set your mind on what is above. Set your mind on what is above. If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at, seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And set your minds and keep them set on what is above, the higher things and not on things that are on the earth. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. So you got to get to the place to recognize as a child of God, when Christ was raised from the dead to a new life, I was risen to him to the same new life. And I received an eternal treasure, which is the DNA, the nature of Christ inside of me. And I'm seated in Christ at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. Therefore, it's my responsibility to set my minds daily to keep setting my mind on what is above, thinking about the things of God, thinking about the influence of the Holy Spirit, allowing them to change your thought life, to govern your mind, and to change your thought life, to be more fruitful and abundant in the kingdom of God, so now I think healthy thoughts. I'm no longer thinking destructive thoughts to destroy my life, but now I'm thinking of things that draw God's attention, the words that will empower him to operate in my life, to strengthen me, and to change everything I'm doing to be, be, be glorifying him through my life. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it says like this, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. 
So we got to think the things that are of the kingdom. Got to have a kingdom mentality on a daily basis. To think on the things that are true, which is God's word. The things that are honest, how God doesn't lie. He always tells the truth in his word. How he's going to change your life, change your destiny. It begin to cause you to prosper in the things of God. Things that are just. Things that are pure. Things that are lovely. Things that have a good report. So whose report would you believe? You're going to believe the doctor report or you're going to believe God's report? When the doctor says you have a condition or illness or mental mental illness, then you'll never be healed. Or you're going to trust God in his word that what God says about me and what he says, and that's what I'm going to think of. And when you think about what God says about you, everything begins to manifest according to what God has spoken to your heart through, through your mind by the Holy Spirit, that your life will be conducive in fashion, in his will, his plan, his purpose, his destiny for your life. Once again, we see the, the same principle. If you want to live the resurrection life that Jesus has provided, then seek that new powerful life by setting your minds and keeping it set on things above and not on the things of the earth. Don't allow people, don't allow people to speak into your ear things that are destructive, to your spirit, that damaging to your life, that cause you to get emotional, to cause you to become aggressive, to cause you to retaliate. Don't allow people to influence you, to get out of your character. I heard people through years growing up, you're going to make me lose my religion. You keep talking to me. You keep saying these negative things to me. I'm going to lose my religion. I'm going to show you who I really am. That's the mindset of the world, the mind of the flesh. The spirit of God says when people come to you with destructive words, you have the right to resist those things, to cast down every imagination, every high thought, the thought that goes against God's word, and bring those thoughts to obedience to Christ, to destroy those thoughts. And that's what God would do by the power of the Holy Spirit. He would shut those thoughts out of your life. But you got to be willing to do it. Apostle Paul is simply saying that if you, if you and I want the good life, then we must keep our minds on good things. If you want, and you want your children, you want your family to have a good life, then you got to begin to change your thinking and change their thinking. Because when you change your mind, you have the power to influence your children when they're young, to shape their minds in the good life that Christ has given you through, Christ, through, through the blood and the death and the resurrection of Christ Jesus. And everything that God promises in your life is yes and amen. So God said, now when you change your mindset, your life, you can change your children's life. And the life that you live will now be a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Many believers want the good life, but they are passively sitting around wishing that something good would happen to them. Many believers want the good life, but they are passively sitting around wishing that something good would happen to them. Many of us done that. We always say, Why, how come good stuff always happens to that person or that person? Seems like God passes me by. Like God don't care about me. So I wish God would bless me. I wish God would send checks in my mail. I wish God would bless me with a new car. I wish God would give me a house. I wish God would do this or do that. So we wish it. Instead of praying and making a declaration according to the word of God, because he said you will have what you say. If you believe and do not doubt your heart, whatever you say, you will have according to the word of God. Read Mark 11, chapter, verse 22 to 26. And I tell you the first verse he says, have faith in God. When you have the God kind of faith, you don't have to sit around wishing and hoping and, and, and saying, when God win, these things will happen to me. The same God that blessed my brother and my sister it's the same God that blesses me. When I come into agreement with his word, what he says, that are the promises in the word that I can have, that I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out, everything I touch will be blessed, guess what? I can have what God says. I can have. One thing I learned years ago, when, when a pastor used to make a declaration about the word, he said, God's word, he said, he said this is my Bible, this is God's word, I can have what God says I can have. I will be what God says I will be. And I will do what God says I can do. And that's what we have to declare to ourselves 
on a daily basis. I am what God says I am. I will be what God says I will be. I will do what God says I can do. And when you make that declaration in faith, guess what happens? You shape your destiny in the divinely order of God to manifest in your life the way God structured for things to be in your life. But then it goes on and says, often they are jealous of others who are living in victory and are resentful that their own lives are so difficult. They are jealous of other people who are, who are and are resentful of other people's lives. So, that, so your life becomes difficult. If you desire victory over your problems, if you truly want to live the resurrection life, you must have, have a backbone and not just a wishbone. If you truly want to live and abide in a victorious life, you must have a backbone and not a wishbone. I remember growing up, we, my mom would make some uh, uh, bro, uh, a roasted chicken. And every now and then you find a wishbone in that chicken. And you grab one of your brothers and sisters and say, hey, grab the other end of this, this, this wishbone. We're going to make a wish. And we, we would hope that wish would come to pass in our life. And that's one thing about God. We don't have to wish with God. We don't have to come to God with a wish list. We can come to God with a faith list. And with a faith list, we can tell God, this is what I'm believing that you're going to do in my life. You're going to deem it to be possible. You're going to manifest in my life. Your promises in my life. Everything I need, you're going to supply according to your riches and glory when I seek first your kingdom. And I guarantee God will manifest his promises in your life when you walk by faith and not by sight. So right action begins with right thinking. Right action begins with right thinking. Don't be passive in your mind. Start today choosing right thoughts. So you have to start today. After hearing this message, you're held accountable for this message. And God's going to look at you on a daily basis to see if you're holding up to your word, what you just heard tonight, and allowing God to manifest this word in your thought life to change your behavior and your actions according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And I guarantee when you start today choosing right thoughts, you will have right actions that will follow suit. So Lord, tonight we thank you for your word. I pray God your word has not fallen from deaf ears, but your word will manifest in the lives of all the hearers who heard this word tonight and, and cause them to come to accountability to acknowledge our mistakes and our faults and failures and shortcomings and allow you to change our thought life on how we view ourselves or even view other people after the flesh. But now we view ourselves after the spirit, the way you ordain for our lives to be, that you would change everything about us according to your will to be manifested in our lives from this day forward. And now, Lord, we ask that you forgive us for our sins, knowingly and unknowingly, and to wash us in the blood of the Lamb. And then, Lord, become our Lord and Savior. And we thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I pray that something has been said tonight that encourages you to get into the Word of God, to allow the Word of God to manifest in your thought life, to change your attitude, to change your nature, to change your DNA. Then you have the blood of Jesus flowing through your veins from this day forward with the life that's, that's a victorious life a life that's pleasing in the sight of God, and a life that's fruitful in the kingdom of God. Amen. I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. You stay encouraged. Don't allow the enemy to deceive you with the wrong thinking anymore, but to recognize those thoughts are not of God and allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart and transform your thinking daily, not sometimes, but daily, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I guarantee your life will change for the better as you walk by faith and not by sight. God bless you, everyone. Uh, there's a link on when I sent the invite for the class tonight. There's a link on there if you want to sow a seed into the ministry. Every seed go back into the, to the, uh, the church, goes back for the material that God gives me to teach. And I pray that God touch your heart to sow a seed. And when you sow your seed, expect God to bless you in return with a hundredfold blessing plus. That's how my faith is. 
I don't just sow seeds just to be sowing seed. But when I give, I expect God. I pray over my seed. Every time I give a seed in church, I pray over that seed. And I thank God for the harvest in return. For what I want God to do in my life, that this is the breaking ground of sowing seed to watch God manifest the promises he has for my life and my family as I trust him at his word. You do the same thing, walk by faith, walk, walk not by sight, but walk in the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit in the truth and righteousness of God's word. Until next week, stay encouraged. Share this message with somebody else that you know that might need to hear this. And I guarantee when you do that, God will bless you in return. Until next week, shalom. May the peace of God and the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in you henceforth, now, and forevermore until we meet again. God bless you. Amen.